Well, hi, everybody. It's nice to see you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Gregory, and uh, I took a little road trip from Vermont uh, to come on over here. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm truly honored to be here. And uh, part of the reason why I'm so honored and I feel so humbled to be out on this stage is because of the incredible work uh, that everybody in this state is doing. Um, before traveling out here, I spoke with a mentor about this feeling of feeling um, a little nervous, a little humbled, a little, uh, you know, um, maybe a little bit unworthy even to be on the stage with so many incredible people doing work here. And my mentor told me, he said, you know, if you feel honored, it's because you recognize the great work of the people here at Recovery Reinvented. People like Catherine and Doug Burgum, who have made a difference for all of us in the work of recovery nationally. People like Raina, uh, who helped to organize today and continually connected in the days leading up to today. And people like Jonathan Holf, who is a true visionary and a truer friend. And people like all of you, like I said, dedicating your time to this vital mission. So yes, it is an honor to be standing here. For my small part today, I wanna talk about the power of promise, the power of hope, and how one ripple can reach far beyond its origin. So let me do something a little different and tell you about someone named Jenna. Jenna, for all intents and purposes, uh, she grew up in what we would call a, a normal household. She had lots of friends, she loved to ride horses and to swim. Uh, she was successful in school. By accounts of her friends and family, she had the world in front of her. That changed when she was prescribed prescription pain medication, which started her on a six-year struggle of increasing addiction. She cycled through treatment centers all across the country. She joined groups and yet slid ever under the spell of substance use disorder. I know this is a familiar story to many of you sitting here and watching online today. She wanted so badly to get better. And for a while, she was on a better path. She ended up finding a place that really worked for her. And when she was there, she said something to her mom on a phone conversation then. In a moment of determination and vision, she knew what she was going to do. And so she made a promise, something that would one day change our state. Mom, she said, when I get out of here, me and you are gonna help people. It was her call to action for herself and for others to join. My little sister was 26 years old when she died of an overdose. She tried so hard to realize the dream of helping others, like her, to see the light of that person and what good they could do fade forever. The world seemed a darker place. But death does set forth many things despite its purported finality. Funerals had to be set, and my wife Amy and I had to help write an obituary. The words failed us at first. And then we remembered how Jenna wanted to help others like her. And though she was gone, her life and her journey and her dream nudged us. We decided to take the leap and be open about her struggles with addiction. And it nudged us into the words. We wrote about why she died. We wrote a message to those who struggled and we offered hope as she would have done. And that nudge we felt, that was part of the obituary too. I know we've mentioned a couple times today about ripples going onward. We put that in the obituary as well. We wrote that, quote, Jenna's journey was like a rock thrown into a lake, sending ripples ever outward into the future. The obituary was a moment for us, a ripple, a nudge that changed the direction of our family's lives. As that memorial made waves across the state, we saw the untapped desire and the unmet need out there for hope. It wasn't long before people started coming up to us, first at the funeral and then in the weeks that followed, and they began to share their stories to us as well. One after another, we heard it. My brother is struggling, my cousin, my friend, my daughter. That moment confirmed to us that the crisis was far bigger than just Jenna. It was woven into the lives 
of so many people who had been living in silence, looking for answers, looking for hope. And something beautiful happened. Our community banded together, not just to comfort us, but to share their own pain and to support an effort to help take action. You know, when I was younger, I came across a passage in a book that stuck with me all through these years. Um, it's where a student and a mentor were talking about some, some large, overwhelming problem. And this student is talking about how it's been going on for ages and we don't have very good answers, he begins. But the mentor cuts him off. You'll never have an answer, she says. But you can be an answer. For us, friends, neighbors, even strangers rallied around us in the days following Jenna's death. It wasn't just about one family's grief anymore. It was about all of us coming together in the face of a much larger crisis. We banded together in our shared vulnerability, and in doing so, we've started to bind the wounds that we all carry. That phrase, banding and binding, is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. It's what we did in my community after Jenna's death, and it's something I know happens in your towns in your groups, with your people as well. Together, we band together, and through that shared vulnerability, we help each other heal. Our community supported our family and helped turn that shared pain into collective action. This is the story of Jenna's promise. <clears throat> so Jenna's promise, um, we came up with that name basically because we felt that um, we wanted to create a recovery village model, essentially. And um, the idea was that it was based on this community support. So we call ourselves a recovery village model, and we're located in northern Vermont. It's a small town of about 3,500. Um, and so the name, this organization, was based off of that quote, that, that promise that Jenna made. And it feels right for the family and then a growing group of people to be able to take that on. So in the middle is Jenna. Surrounded by Jenna is uh, my wife, Amy, on the right side, uh, my father, Greg, my mother, Don, my son, Eisen, and myself. Um, you know, it was the family that began this journey, but it would end up a movement with a team of absolutely amazing professionals in the support of our community. But we began this chapter at an old abandoned Catholic church up on a hill in Johnson. Jenna and I grew up in Johnson. We were altar servers at the church, and my father and I would shovel the steps in the winter, and the big long ramp, and the other steps. And as a kid, <laughs> I didn't love it. When Jenna died, it was just before President's Day weekend in 2019. There were no open spaces for us to hold her funeral reception, none except that old church. It was a beautiful reception, and as my parents walked out, they saw the asking price for the building, and it almost exactly matched Jenna's life insurance money. We now call the building Jenna's House, and it's a community center for the area. And I'm back to shoveling the steps, by the way, too. Jenna's house opened its doors in August of 2021. Hundreds of people showed up that day. And hundreds continue through the year. We host big movie nights and holiday events. And we host more intimate family meetings, recovery meetings, meditation, yoga. Community groups rent the space out, too. As our rural areas have been hollowed out, and are fading at an alarming rate in this country, it means so much that Jenna's house has been called, quote, the new heart of Johnson. And as we gather at these different events, they're open to everybody. One person next to you might be in recovery, the other might not be, but we are all together at this gathering. And just by that simple act, we start to break down the stigma that people hold for people with substance use disorder. Johan Hari once said that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. And that's what we're working to build at Jenna's House. And not only for people in recovery that we serve, it's for the community too. It's a means of stitching ourselves and our towns back together. We hit this theme with our policy and political work across the state. We bring people in, no matter what party, no matter what political persuasion, 
and for tours of our model that I'm about to show you. We give them space to host community conversations with people in our recovery program and with the neighborhood. And it works. They become more educated on the topic and more active in the work of recovery. But this is just one piece of what we're endeavoring to do. We're also trying to fundamentally shift the paradigm of recovery in our state. Too often, people leave treatment. And in Vermont, it isn't the usual standard of 30 days. It's 14. They leave treatment and return to the place they're living. They return to their friends. They return to their economic struggles. They have no place to, safe place to stay, no support to fill in the gaps of their skills, often without any IDs to get a job, often in an unhealthy and dangerous situation. And then there are people out there collectively who act shocked when people return to use. Some studies show that as many as 70, 80, even 90% of people with opioid use disorder return to use within a year. Many of them, a plurality of them, within a week or two after leaving treatment, when they're most vulnerable. Our village model is the result of seeing the same phenomenon with Jenna through our lives and with many others. And we aim to fill in the gaps of the current and struggling national model with ideas that we hope could be replicated by others. We bring residents in directly from treatment and we wrap them up. Then this incredible team seeing the cracks uh, that are in this, these systems and during these vulnerable times, this incredible team I get to work with, they act as a cast. It gives them space, it gives them time, it gives them support to heal. We call it a phased roadway that helps residents of this program develop themselves toward a position of strength and independence. This isn't only about are you sober, it's about are you strengthening your abilities, identifying your skill gaps, and then trying to help bridge them. We have three phases in our roadway, and as residents meet the requirements for each phase, they can move on to the next. Our roadway is held up by four pillars that you can see here. Um, we have a program-based residential program. We have a clinical program, a health and wellness program, and a workforce development program. They transition from strong supports in the early days where their schedule mapped out by case managers, their days filled with programming to more independence and more ability to mold the model to fit their needs. Once a resident meets the phase requirements of each pillar, then everyone comes together and they can graduate to that next phase. The original pillar is our program-based recovery housing. And it's the most intensive of the program because uh, it's engaging residents closely from dusk to dawn. We've adapted this system to emphasize behavioral health with staff, ta staff trained similarly to those in behavior intervention settings. Case managers meet weekly with residents for check-ins and guiding them along this phase roadways. They coordinate doctor's appointments, manage medications, help with transportation. And our extraordinary peer support team provides the essential hands-on support, the unique element that breathes life into this part of the program. And it's all led by the vision of our recovery residence director who has run behavioral programs for years. And she meets with them one-on-one -on -one to build coping and replacement skills as well. We currently have three recovery residences that start highly structured and then move toward echoing completely independent living. And these buildings were once abandoned in our town and we brought them back to life. The next pillar is clinical. While offering weekly check-ins and psychological supports, the keystone of this pillar is a DBT-paced intensive outpatient program. This IOP takes place during the first 12 or so weeks of people's time during the program, taking the first half of the day for early phase residences. The impact of IOP has been a game changer, and it makes sense, because as many of you know, just not using isn't the answer. We must instead look to address the root causes of substance use. And this is why our IOP is trauma-based, too. Our health and wellness program is the third pillar of our model and our newest addition. Health and wellness have become essential to Jenna's Promise Recovery Village, offering some of our most paradigm-shifting work. After all, how can someone focus on recovery if they don't feel well? Good nutrition, sufficient sleep, physical activity are all critical. When people come to us fresh from treatment, they're often biologically unstable and have spent months or even years more focused on substance use rather than the healthy habits and self-care. Here we guide residents in nutrition and gym familiarity, yoga, meditation, setting healthy boundaries, and discovering a personalized wellness path. We've launched uh, an integrated wellness continuum where it's an extension of our IOP. They meet daily with our program manager, 
and they help to replace unhealthy habits formed during active use with skills that support lasting wellness. Our last pillar is our workforce development program. In the early days of joining a recovery village, residents are facing inward, and that's necessary. They're focused on stabilizing their bodies, their brains, and their new lives. But even then, our workforce development program manager is there, setting the stage for that future day when they begin to turn outward and look toward the future about what they want to be. This isn't news to anyone here, but I want to emphasize just how high the barriers can be for people starting fresh and looking for work. Most of our residents lack the ID needed to complete the legal paperwork for a job. They often have large gaps in their resumes, an immediate red flag for any HR department. Many don't even have a resume or even know how to approach an interview. Our program manager removes all these barriers. The other thing they deal with is stigma. My family often tells a story of my sister interviewing for a job when she was newly in recovery. She told her mother afterward that uh, she nailed the interview, but as she left, she overheard them say, we'll never hire her. She's a druggie. Well, as my father likes to say, we will hire them at our social enterprises, and we will give them a safe place to work, free from that shame and that bigotry. The first social enterprise that they join is JP's Promising Goods. It's intentionally low-key and functions as a laboratory for residents to work the muscles of retail and get job experience under their belt. They leave JPs under our other social enterprises or outside work. It's important to note that JPs plays a role beyond just the resident-facing one. A big piece of it is it offers highly discounted goods to an economically disadvantaged county, and it thrives off the human interaction between the public and our residents, helping with the sense of community, for our town and a sense of connection for those in our program. Jenna's Coffee House is a true partnership. We bought an abandoned cafe in town and we brought it back to life with the support of a community block grant. We now rent the space to a wonderful bakery called Two Sons, which agrees to hire qualified residents. This collaboration is what created this cafe as a fully functioning business. Both program participants and locals work here with real accountability. They can be promoted or let go based on performance. Together, they offer a welcoming space and add vibrancy to our town by serving baked goods and coffee, an experience that had been lost in Johnson for years. All the while, our residents are gaining valuable job skills. The last of our social enterprises is Jenna's Promise Roasting Company. We roast high quality uh, specialty coffee on site. Residents can also utilize this for workforce development. We are also proud to say that Jenna's Promise is the official coffee for Vermont rest areas, which sees millions of people walk through their doors. And every time they grab coffee, they're learning about the importance of recovery, the importance of substance use disorder, and learning Jenna's story. In some ways, it functions in the vein of Newman's Own, serving a cause and a mission. It's where the message of Jenna's Promise and the crisis of substance use is out on store shelves across Vermont. Not only do we work on roasting the best coffee from around the world, we build awareness and outreach. So head on over to jennaspromiseroasting.com and buy a lot of it. The key to this is all of our social enterprises are working to help people um, with a larger understanding of the disease of addiction and basically, our programming is willing to work with all aspects and pillars of the program, too. But further, it breaks down the stigma of addiction. Instead of druggies or those people, instead, of, I'm reminded of a quote that I once heard Chris Christie say, where he says, it's hard to hate up close. It is hard to hate up close when a smiling young woman who worked her way up to management hands you a steaming cappuccino with a smile. It matters not that she was once struggling with addiction in those small moments. She's just like any of us. And it's the small moments that push the lines of our cause, of this cause here today, stigma reduction, forward. Because when we stare directly at it, we see this stigma can be a brittle thing. Conversation helps strip it of its power. All of these social enterprises, especially the roasting company, cycle profits back into the program 
The goal here is to try to attain more and more self-sufficiency. If we truly believe that this is something that can be replicated, then self-sufficiency is key. But it's what it does for our rural community that is really important to me. As we've said, and as the governor has said, rural areas are being hollowed out in our country. Jenna's Promise has, across town, reinvigorated six abandoned buildings and brought something needed to our town. A cafe on Main Street, a surplus goods store, a roastery, plus a community center and recovery housing. People are stopping in town again, not driving through. We are not just in the business of addiction recovery, but recovery for our struggling communities too. And I think that's some of the secret of how we've escaped some of the nimbyism that I'm sure so many people are familiar with in uh, the recovery world. Instead of fear, our communities are getting something out of this too. And they feel like they're part of a larger mission. For our residents, the pillars of program-based residency, clinical health and wellness, workforce development, they all come together to guide them through the phases of our program. In the end, the goal is for residents to return to living independently in a community of their choosing. But oftentimes, they stay in town. They found a job, they found a home, and they found a group of people in this town that support them, a sense of connection with others who call Johnson home. No matter their path, we aim to help give them an on-ramp back onto the highway of life. Because too often, the road to long-term recovery can be long and difficult and lonely. I saw it with Jenna. Our family did. But while it's still early days, we believe our village model is demonstrating strong potential as an innovative approach to recovery. Over the past couple of years, we've seen encouraging results that suggest our comprehensive approach could offer some lasting success beyond the standard return to use rates. People leave with jobs, they leave reunited with their kids, fully independent, and in strong and stable recovery. Again, it's not just about that I'm sober today, it's about so much more about building skills and networks and experience alongside not using as well. And they take all of that together and they use it as they take their next steps into another world. So we believe we've stumbled upon something special in little old Johnson, Vermont, and something that the governor has said uh, many times that I really admired is he said that um, he really thinks that it's, it's um, important to note that big things can happen in small towns. And we believe that we've seen something special here. And I hope that Jenna, if she were here, would be proud to see the legacy of her ripples um, and what they brought into our little town in Johnson. But nationally, I get it. Things are still bleak. I feel like in our place in Vermont, we're constantly walking the knife's edge between heartbreak and hope, and despair can creep into any of us. At our community center, we have a memorial wall, a tribute to those who have lost their lives to substance use. It began as a simple memorial, but it's grown beyond our vision. That wall should not have filled up so quickly, and yet photos continue to come in. Another man in his 20s, another handwritten note saying, this is a picture of my son. The sheer number of photos has forced us to layer them, stacking them closely together, becoming a wall unto themselves, frame by frame and brick by brick, a towering monument to lost. And that's just one town in rural Vermont. Overdose deaths are overwhelming our country. As Jonathan Holt likes to say, and the governor mentioned today too, it's the equivalent of a 747 plane going down every single day. If these were actual 747s, you know we would stop all flights across the country, as was said earlier, until we could figure out what was going on. But despite all those overdose deaths, we continue as a society just to go on with our day. And the overdose crisis remains an asterisk in our national conversation. Silence is the fuel in the engine of this epidemic. I've been asked before, is it too much to have hope in these dark times? Is it naive to hold on to a promise? And yeah, I get it. I see why people might be concerned. Easier to accept that the world we live in today is one that should ignore the currency of promises. Like cast aside pennies we walk over in the street. Wouldn't that just make the world simpler? If we could just inject enough cynicism into the world, 
Maybe we would just be able to live our lives without the thought of being let down. I can't accept that, and no one should, that world or that view, because if something is absent of promise, it is absent of hope. I have a friend who's fond of saying, hope stands for hold on, possibilities exist. Without promise, we look backwards, focusing on the what ifs, and it centers on the void of loss. Promises, though, are inherently future-oriented. Mom, when I get out of here, we're going to help people. There was something Jenna held on to in her last days. It was something that propelled her forward, that pulled her in a better direction. And while Jenna is gone, her promise remains, propelling us all forward, pulling our community in this crisis in a more hopeful direction. So a promise is a ripple. Catherine Burgum's words during the presidential announcement of Governor Burgum inspired my wife Amy and I. We hopped in the car, as was mentioned, with two kids and drove three hours to meet her and the governor. The small ripple of a speech connected Jenna's promise with the -the out-of-the-box thinking of leadership at Recovery Reinvented and the people of North Dakota. Connections with the current that can help end this crisis and make waves of change happen. Because waves, like waves of an addiction crisis, can cause immense pain and devastation. But waves, ripples, they can also cleanse. They can stir things up and they can introduce new currents into stagnant water. Waves can change people too. It can wash them away. Or it can propel them forward in ways they may not have ever expected, going further than they could on their own. I'm here speaking to a room of professionals and change makers because I want to help carry on my sister's legacy. And that has given me the courage I would never have had the strength to do otherwise. So in looking at the groundbreaking work of Recovery Reinvented at the work that we're doing in Johnson, I think promise is also a compass too. It can guide us to our destination, leading us toward a new and superior way. That doesn't mean that the way forward is always clear. That doesn't mean that the struggle isn't worth it. I myself have fought a really tough chronic illness for nearly 12 years. I was so sick at times, I thought I was gonna die. There was no clear path forward for me. There was no compass to show me another way. The structure of care, the paradigm that was in use for people like me, It didn't work. For me, like so many others struggling to get better, there was no promises of a better future. I felt abandoned by the institutions who I were told to save me. The life I live now isn't perfect, but I view each day as a gift after the dark, anguished specters of the past. Similarly, we had no compass with Jenna. I can remember the family wondering and saying, what should we do? In the end, I learned something. That sometimes the system The paradigm is inadequate to meet the moment. Sometimes there is no clear path forward, and that old road that you've been told to go down leads to nothing but discouragement. So many of you have experienced this too. Remember when prescription pills weren't addictive? Or if treatment doesn't work, it's your fault? But within that husk of frustration, I think there are seeds of hope. Many of us have emerged from our struggles realizing that you can never let someone hold you back because they say something hasn't been done before, that you have to go down one of those older, more well-trodden, yet ultimately lacking paths. Well, sometimes the old ways need to be challenged to bring forth the promise of forging a new and better way. To shift a paradigm, to try something new can be scary. There's something heady about experimentation, about daring to challenge the way things are. But here's the secret about those old ways of thinking. They too were once unexplored, waiting to be blazed by a brave pathfinder. They once shared the parad- or shifted the paradigm. And if you think about it like that, then the way forward isn't so scary anymore. There's a line from this movie called Poor Things that says, it is the only way it is until we discover the new way it is. And then that is the only way it is until we discover the new way it is. And so it goes until the world is no longer flat and electricity lights the night. It can help you realize that instead of being stuck with black and white thinking and choices, there's always another means to get to where you need to go. There's always another choice. There is the promise of bringing forth a new future, and that's what I see at Recovery Reinvented. As the philosopher Umberto Eco once said, show not what has been done, but what can be. 
That is the promise of this moment, the ability to bring forth desperately needed change in a system that is broken. That is the work that the Burghams and Recovery reinvented. That is the work that I hope we are doing at Jenna's Promise. And that is the promise of a day like today, too. There is so much talent in this building, we could light up the whole room. Each of you is here, right now, compass in hand, going forth onto the unbeaten path. This is your moment individually as well, as we stand on the brink of change. Where will your compass take you? What answer will you be? What ripples will you leave behind? Thank you very much, everybody.